June day in Milwaukee. A hot sun beats down on the Milwaukee Mile, but we're ready to race. Start your engines. And Then he chased Michael Andretti, almost got a victory last week at Gateway International Raceway, but came up a fraction of a second short. Today, he's on the pole for the first time for Hogan Racing, hoping that he can break through and get the first win. How about contenders? Let's go to Jan Bikas. Well, Gary, at the start, keep your eyes on row number three on the outside, Paul Tracy, Mr. Excitement himself. In qualifying, the car was really loose. That's why he's back here. They have since fixed it. He's going to the front. Right next door, Mr. Excitement Jr., Juan Montoya. We know this guy can stand on it. In qualifying, he had a big push. They have fixed it as well. This guy's going to the front. Last week in St. Louis, the Champ Cars put on a classic oval racing show. Today, they visit a classic venue, the Milwaukee Mile, the oldest track in the world. Two of the classic names in open wheel racing, Andretti and Unzer, have tasted victory here in the past. Al Unzer Jr. led in Rio and St. Louis, but it's been 57 races since his last win. Andretti went 23 without a win, but put on a classic performance, holding off a late race charge at St. Louis. Milwaukee means traffic, close quarter racing, and action. A classic short track battle. presents the cars of the Kart FedEx Championship Series on the Milwaukee Mile in the Miller Lite 225. Hello, welcome to Wisconsin. I'm Paul Page with Parker Johnstone. We want you to consider the defending champion of this race, Jimmy Vassar, the 1996 Series Champion. He's a easygoing, outgoing, fun-loving race driver who has matured greatly since his championship. But this year, with a new rookie teammate, he faces a bit of an uphill battle. And for the first time in recent memory, the target Chip Ganassi team has actually split their pits, with Jimmy's pits physically separate from Juan Montoya's. Paul, for most drivers, having a dominant force like Alex Zanardi the last three years would be your worst nightmare. This year, Jimmy's been overshadowed by his teammate, Juan Montoya. Jimmy's had a lot of bad fortune, but this weekend, for the first time this year, he's put his car on the front row. He won the race a year ago this weekend, and he's back, Paul, and he's determined to show the paddock he is a champion's champion. The qualifying gave us another brand new pole sitter as Elio Castroneves danced for joy on taking the pole. He'll start inside the front row with the defending champion, Jimmy Vassar, starting on the outside. In the second row, it will be Greg Moore and the Scotsman, Dario Franchitti. Row three, Juan Montoya will start alongside Paul Tracy. Back in the fourth row, Cristiano D'Amata and Patrick Carpentier. In the fifth row, Roberto Moreno subbing for Mark Bundell and Alex Barron. Row number six, last week's winner, Michael Andretti and Mauricio Guzman. The seventh row, Christian Fittipaldi and P.J. Jones. In row eight, Scott Pruitt and Jill DeFerrin. The ninth row, Max Pappas with a new livery on the car and Adrian Fernandez. The tenth row is Richie Hearn and Tony Kanaan. In row 11, Michelle Jourdain Jr. and Al Unzer with the Lola. The 12th row, Robbie Gordon and Shigeaki Hattori. And the 13th and final row, Brian Herta and Dennis Vitolo. And as we take a look at the race analysis, Parker, tires are really the key here. They are, Paul. Once again, to reduce speeds, they've gone to the small wings. The tire manufacturers, to make up for the lost grip, have come with a very soft, sticky tire. We can see that the cars can almost go 100 laps on fuel. Can they make it on tires? I don't think so. A lot of the teams don't think so. That'll be the big story today. We have to watch the Goodyear shot cars. They haven't been having the wear problem that the Firestone runners have. They'll lose grip after the first three to five laps, but it's actually the wearing out of the tires that's the big concern. Pace car accelerates on the back stretch. Margie well at the wheel of the pace car. The front row begins to accelerate. We're ready to go here on the Milwaukee Mile, adding to 96 years of history at this venerable racetrack. 
Elio Castroneves brings them through the corner on the fourth turn now begins his acceleration. They've been cautioned greatly about the starts. And they wave this one off as well. Again, the requirement is that no one get a full car jump on one another. You remember a week ago, they waved off the start there too. And in the driver's meeting, Parker, and with the conversations afterwards between the starter and the front row, they said, we want you to get these starts nice and clean. They're maintaining the pace car speed until they get to the middles of turns three and four. There are two cones there. There are some paint strips. They want the drivers to gradually accelerate from that point onward. So now coming back, hopefully, for a green once again. They take a look at the lineup of the field. Lap one, of course, counts because of fuel restrictions on the cars. They come off of the corner. Green flag comes out. Here we go now. As Montoya darts left and right back in the field, looking for racing room. The two team green cars come together and are now racing with one another. But it's Castro Nevis that takes the lead. Jimmy Vassar drops into second place and begins to challenge. Frank Keedy then followed by Paul Tracy. And Paul, in that opening lap, Michael Andretti was three abreast on the outside of turns one and two. He went around the outside of Carpaccio. The yellow flag comes out. The yellow flag comes out. And it's a quick four and stay low. Doesn't look like contact, but P.J. Jones spun it around, and he's got a little turbo fire burning there. That'll burn itself out. That's the big concern, Paul. Cold tires with this low downforce configuration with a lot of turbulence on the opening laps. It's very easy to get, especially on the throttle, coming off the corners and turn the car right around. We'll see if we can find out what happened to P.J. Jones. He's big sideways coming through. Oh, a big evasive maneuver there. Wow, some great driving by some of the guys in the back to miss P.J. Jones. We'll see if we can look at him one more time here. As we pick him up, he's already sideways. A great bit of driving, the fact that he caught that, Paul, but even better driving on the efforts of all the other drivers who were able, in just a split second, to make those, those decisions that can mean the end of your race just that quick. Yeah, just at a glance, Hearn, Hattori, Allinger Jr., all with nifty driving just to keep from getting involved with that spin. We'll take a look at the way Max Pappas saw this one. Coming down into turn three, trying to ground the outside of Scott Pruitt there. And you can see P.J. up on the high side. Yeah, oh boy, that's close. And I think what happened, P.J. was just in that higher groove trying to get on the throttle, and the car just turned around on him, Paul. Now we'll add uh, Max Pappas to that list of uh, those that were very close on that one. Jan Bikas, any information on P.J.? Well, I spoke with his crew, and Jim McGee said simply, he just spun. I said, cold tires? He says, I don't think so on a day like today. He says the guy was a little too aggressive, but if we can get him going, we'll be back in this thing. Well, already they have the engine restarted, so P.J. will go in the field, which is still moving under the yellow with just the first couple of laps complete. Castro Nevis, of course, jumps from the pole and maintains the lead. We'll be back. Page with Parker Johnstone, a look down from the Honda Helicam on the Milwaukee Mile. And Paul, in traditional oval racing, even though this looks like Milwaukee only has two corners, we actually have turns one, two, three and turns four. So when we talk about these different corners, so folks don't get confused, they actually split the two corners into mid-section segments. So the entry going into the first corner pass start finishes turn one, the exit is two, and similarly for three and four. The track is banked about three degrees, hardly any at all, and the cars still reach speeds of almost 200 miles an hour. And once again, Crasper Nevis begins to pick the pace up as they flow toward the green flag. Green comes out, here we go again, keep an eye on Montoya back as he begins to maneuver alongside of Paul Tracy. Tracy cuts him off into one across two. You ride with Montoya. You can see him downshift there, Paul. Most of the drivers are using fifth and sixth gears, running down the straightaways in fifth. You'll see him upshift here as he comes off the corner up into sixth gear. And then using the brakes for the entry of turns one and three. Michael Andretti on the move as he begins to uh, try to thread his way up through the field. Also moving, Greg Moore, who started from third and dropped back to sixth. Paul Tracy, sixth, came up to fourth. And Michael, who of course is coming up through the field very quickly, comes alongside Cristiano Damata. We'll take a look when we can at the Kmart telemetry. 
Paul, we saw Michael qualifying a little farther back at both St. Louis and here than he wanted to, but it didn't stop him. And on the opening laps, Michael was three abreast going through turns one and two, and then side by side through three and four. His experience is really coming into play. Watch this Ford Cosworth accelerate as he comes off the fourth corner. Grab six gear. Just over 190 miles an hour, hard on the brakes. They're pulling about a G and a half under braking, three and a half Gs a cornering. Now, once again, hard on the throttle as he comes out of the second corner. And as Andretti's been able to pull away just a little bit, the, the battle begins to build just behind Michael. Gary Gerald. Quick update on Michael Andretti. There was concern just as they went green after the yellow. He reported a vibration that he thought somehow related to brakes. But the team's feeling would be once they get up and get them rolling and he gets into the race rhythm, they thought maybe it would not be a problem. Something to just keep in the back of our mind. Looks like he's going strong now. Leo Castro Nevis with 213 to go is leading the fourth race he's led this year. And he had only three races in his career prior to this season. Castro Nevis with Jimmy Vassar chasing him. We look a little deeper in the field at Cristiano D'Amato. Andretti, once he got around him, was able to separate. But behind D'Amato is Moreno and Carpentier. There they come into view. And it tightens up right here. Cristiano D'Amato and his engineer Ian Watt have spent the entire weekend trying to figure out how to get the most laps, the greatest durability out of the Firestone tires. And Paul, I think what we're going to see is this race will really come into its own when we get 50, 60 laps in. I think there could be a real shifting in the field, but for now, you can see the cars are starting to bunch up behind Cristiano D'Amata as Mike Landretti continues to pull a gap every lap with that following or trailing group of cars. Yeah, it's a pretty tight group. Jimmy Vassar just jumped into the lead. Jimmy Vassar just got around. As Castro Nevis comes totally off the throttle. We looked up the track for Castro Nevis. Slowed down, well off the pace. Serious problem for Elio Castro Nevis, the pole sitter and the early leader. Oh, we've got to report boost problems. A lack of boost, maybe no boost whatsoever for Castro Nevis. Great frustration here in his camp. So Jimmy Vassar just suddenly, with the slowing of Elio Castro Nevis, picks up the lead of the race, moving Frank Keedy to second, Tracy to third, Montoya to fourth. That's Carl Hogan. He is the car owner for Castro Nevis on the far right there. And Paul, it's so hard as a team struggles and fights and claws its way to the top. There's a tremendous amount of pressure on the driver. In this case, Elio Castro Nevis and his engineer, Casper Vandershoot. But once they achieve that first pole position, all of a sudden the focus and the pressure shifts to the crew. They have to make sure that they give their driver and engineer a perfect race car that's as reliable as it can be. So you know that the mechanics are on pins and needles right now as they try to figure out what's wrong with this Mercedes bowl accommodation. You ride with a guy who's really the key factor in the field right now. It's Michael Andretti who has been steadily moving forward, now occupies sixth place. The order in front of him, Vassar, Franchitti, Tracy, Montoya, Moore. And as we watch Michael Andretti, so typical of Michael as he goes into the first corner and the third corner, he turns in much earlier than any of the other drivers. He really diamonds off the corners. You can see it there as he follows Greg Moore. As he comes off the corner, Paul, watches entry at the end of this next straightaway into turn one. Watch how he goes in a lot earlier than Greg Moore. Almost a full car with him. He does that for a couple of reasons, mostly because he's got the car set up to understeer a little bit more and also because he's looking for clean air. We'll see it again as he goes down into turn three. You can see him already looking towards the inside. And there it is. He crosses over that black patch strip much sooner than Greg, but you can really see it going down into the first corner. And you can see there, Paul, he's even looking for clean air to get the most out of his swift chassis. Look at there. You know what is a surprise to me is not far behind this battle remains Elio Castro Nevis, Cristiano D'Amata. Well, now Nevis slows down even further, but Despite having the problem, he's out there trying to keep it going. I would have thought he might have headed for the pitch. Well, you would think so, Paul, but at this point, maybe they're hoping for a yellow or any opportunity to not have to service or have a look at that car under the green, but he's losing time so quickly. And one of the reasons for that, guys, is they have reduced the speed limit in the pitch to 50 miles an hour for the first time. 
So it really would take a dire problem for someone to want to come onto pit road because you'll lose at least one lap, maybe more. Well, now he's fallen all the way to 15th place. And further yet, as Scott Pruitt and Tony Kanaan get by, he's fallen to 18th now. Back up at the front. And I've been watching the lap times. Jimmy Vassar's been turning pretty consistent, 24.8s, 24.9s. But in trail, Dario Franchitti right now is the fastest man on the racetrack, nearly a full half a second quicker, running 24.3s, 24.2s. And I think he's really trying to close that gap up. He's about 2.6 seconds behind, but on that last lap, Jimmy Vassar responded with a lap equally as quick as Dario Franchitti. Castro Nevis there on the inside as traffic continues to string around him. Michael Andretti just got around Greg Moore. So Andretti now up to fifth place. Look back through the field. Here comes Tracy with Montoya. They are overhauling Brian Herta, who moves to the outside. But they begin to fight, too. They split Hattori who is actually battling right now with Brian Herta, who, remember, started well in the back of the field, did not have a good qualifying nor a good weekend to this point. Well, Michael Andretti, the key factor, while uh, hop in the swing and enjoy everything up over the track as well as the action on it. We'll be back. As we show you the current standings, the leader, Jimmy Vassar, beginning now to work very heavy traffic, which is always a factor here. Jill DeFerrin is also moving his way up through this field. DeFerrin uh, started well back, now runs in 14th place. There he is, and that's part of this whole tire story that should play out during the day. Well, it is. I think Jill DeFerrin and Alex Barron, who's two slots in front of him, are the two cars that, as these laps wind down on these Goodyear tires, could really prove an interesting section of the race because the Goodyears are getting better wear. They don't have the initial grip of the Firestones, but as they encounter traffic, we should see DeFerrin, as well as Alex Barron, starting to move forward. But I still think it's going to take another 20 or 30 laps before we really see them make their move. On the 29th lap, now on the 28th, P.J. Jones came in for a stop, changed tires. Jan Bikas. Yes, and he came in for a new set of Firestones, and I'm looking at them very carefully, and it does appear as though there's been significant wear. No blistering, but there's still rubber on these tires. If he's coming in already, these Firestone guys could be in trouble. There's no, there's no. Well, in that battle with Jill DeFerrin and Horatio Guzman moved around Castro Nevis, who stays out there. Here comes Fittipaldi working on Moreno, just off the right there. And Christian continues to work on Roberto Moreno. They have the slower car, Dennis Patolo, lying just ahead as they go into turn three. That's Carpentier, lined up just behind Patolo now, who will soon be joining this battle as well. This is really a, a primary place to pass is when you come up on lapped cars. You use them as picks. The real strategy comes in. Do you go left? Do you go right? Do you set the guy going into the corner or set him up coming off? And this is, they know, maybe one of the few opportunities to make their move. Elio Castro Neves comes in, Gary. Boy, this afternoon has turned into a nightmare for the popular young Brazilian driver. He brings it in now, and the crew will go to work. Frankly, I'm not sure what they'll address. They're working, and they shut the engine down. The body counting in the back will come off. But he was complaining of lack of boost or possibly no boost. You saw how dramatically he went backwards. Now they'll try to get rid of the gremlins and hopefully get him out. But clearly, any shot for a first victory is now long gone for the Hogan Racing Rider. Overhauling Al Unser Jr. Not past him yet. He lies just ahead of Jimmy Vassar. But Dario Franchitti is very much into this fight with his teammate Paul Tracy sitting now in third. And Paul coming off that last corner, you can see Jimmy starting to wash off high around the inside of the corner, whereas Dario can run very, very low and very fast. I think Dario's got a better car here, but both their lap times have dropped off almost a second and a half from where they were running before. And look at Dario, Paul. He's got a great car if he can try to make a move around the high side. Franchitti is looking high as they come off before. Paul Tracy closes in as well. On to the home stretch. Franchitti tries low. They're still backed up behind Al Unser Jr. Now Montoya begins to join this fight behind Paul Tracy. And everybody gets bottled up. Oh, Montoya almost loses it in front of Michael. He looks to the inside of Tracy. 
comes down to the inside of Tracy. He's going to try to pick two of them off. Frankini moves to the outside of Vassar, the leader. And I think Frankini's got boxed in there, Paul. I think you want to go down to the low side. Montoya makes his move, so does Michael Andretti. Michael Andretti gets past both of the Team Green cars. You've got to be very, very smart here, Paul. You've really got to use your head. You've got to be aggressive, but at the same time, be patient, or you can throw the whole thing away in only the first 36 laps. It may not be time yet to be this heroic. Well, as they went into the corner, I thought they had Michael. Michael had them both, but now he was having to drop into fourth place. Frankini still runs in second, still pursuing Jimmy Vassar. Montoya now up to third, and then Michael Andretti, followed by Paul Tracy. I can tell you at this stage that all these drivers are driving absolutely as hard as they can, but they, I think Michael and Jimmy are going to exercise maybe a little bit more caution than Montoya might. And at this point, Michael knows there's a lot of racing yet left, and he doesn't want to throw it away this early in the race. Jimmy Vassar is still chasing down Al Unser Jr. This is where the fight is. Michael Andretti, as we pointed out earlier, there's the numbers on him steadily moving up through this field and now chasing Montoya. And where the experience really pays off is Michael knows what the car needs to feel like on full fuel at the beginning of the race to have a good car at the end of the race. And that's something that young Juan Montoya might be coached by Mo Nunn and Chuck Ganassi, but he doesn't know exactly what that feeling is. Michael, especially at the Milwaukee Mile, knows exactly what kind of car he needs to take the trigger flag ahead of everybody else. And I also found it interesting, guys, that we saw the two Team Cool Green cars very close together, and we know that they have had discussions. Paul Tracy and Dario Franchitti, they have said, we're going to look out for each other. We're not going to have happen what happened in St. Louis. And at least we saw in that instance it worked. Fittipaldi got around Carpentier for ninth, the Farron to 11. Elio Castroneves is out, Gary Darrell? Yes, indeed, he's out of the car. Apparently a booster turbo problem of some sort. Did you have any warning that there was going to be a problem when you went green? No, everything was working pretty well. I was so happy. They start and the restart. The car was ending perfect. Hogo Racing did a fantastic job again. and. Uh, uh, we don't know what happened, but probably is the, is the boost problem. Hey, if it's not our turn, next one will be. All right. Carl Hogan offered you encouragement. What did he tell you? Well, he was telling that I was doing a good job uh, so far until that moment. And uh, and I was feeling very strong. And, uh, well, it just uh, sometimes happens in the race. We just have to live with that. See you in Portland. See you there. One month like to be under attack from an Andretti. Michael has been working him hard the past several laps. The battle is for third place. Greg Moore, too, has moved in behind Tracy. So this battle at the front, now seven deep, is still very hot. That previous lap, Paul, Michael got him cleanly down the inside. I bet you Michael was as surprised as anybody to see Montoya re-attack around the outside of turn one. And Michael's trying it again. I don't know if he'll stick it this time. Michael Andretti tries to the inside. No, he still can't do it. But they are still all running behind Al Unser Jr. From Jimmy Vassar down through seventh, all nose to tail. Well, Michael's a fighter. He's now done it to him twice. It was very smart of Michael. He was trying to use Dario Franchitti as a block on the outside, but it didn't work out. Michael's going to figure out how to get this done, because I tell you, that's one determined man there. He's actually backed off a little bit, trying to get some clean air, and that's allowed Tracy to pull up behind him. Michael's going to get a good run coming off this corner and maybe try it on the inside of three. Yeah, Frank Keaty's trying the same thing on the leader as they go screaming into three. On board, Michael. You ride with him. Montoya just ahead. That was the tall that they just moved around. Now Jimmy Vassar looking for racing room high on Allen for Jr trying to get clear of this attack that comes from behind, led by Franchini. And that last slap, Montoya went down the inside, taking away Michael's line and his air, preventing any attack from behind. Michael's really got to get a good run on him, Paul, coming off the fourth corner, making sure that he's on the throttle early and strong if he's going to take a look. 45 miles of this now, and look at him as he makes his move. Unbelievable, just that quick. 45 miles into the race, now 46, and we have a new leader. Dario Franchitti did exactly what I'm saying Michael was trying to do to Juan Montoya. Got a great run on Jimmy coming off the fourth corner. Used the draft perfectly, very late on the brakes down the inside. And, and Jimmy was unable to counter the attack, and here comes Michael trying the same maneuver. Michael Andre looks inside of Montoya. This time he may, in fact, look at Montoya hang out there. 
Oh, they're so close as they come off the two. Montoya has courage. Andretti went down the inside. Now look at Montoya work on his teammate, Vassar. Andretti starts to come back on Montoya. This time he drives it high. Montoya nearly pitched him into the wall on the exit. And Michael is able to get it done this time. Now it's Jimmy Vassar that lies ahead. But Montoya is not going to give up. He's coming right back at him. But now, look at Michael as that easily he works, Vassar. You know, that was really smart on Michael's part. He kept attacking to the inside. And that time he came off the fourth corner and went around the outside. Andretti from second place goes screaming into the lead. Comes down inside of Frank Katie. Unbelievable. Michael just parked his way up through this field. Interestingly enough, the two quickest cars on the track right now are Michael Andretti, obviously, but also his teammate Christian Fittipaldi back in seventh place is the only other car matching lap times with Michael Andretti. Michael tries to make a move on Alonzo Jr. to put him a lap down and relieve some of the pressure from behind. And in fact, he does get that done. So Michael Andretti works up through the field. The lead changes once again. Michael is now the leader. Frank Eady in second. Vassar falls back to third. The Miller Light. 225s continues to be hot. The Park FedEx Championship Series will be at the Budweiser 200 in Portland. Back to the road courses. That's live here on ABC on June 20th. Michael Andretti is now the leader. Interestingly enough, once Michael was able to carve his way through everyone, he began to pull away, and for the most part, that battle for the lead has gone away, though Montoya now begins to work his way up through the field. That was Max Pappas that you saw him working there. The new livery colors make him very similar to the Newman Haas car. Let's go to Jan Beacus. Well, speaking of Newman Haas, I spoke to Peter Gibbons. I said, are you guys speeding up or are they slowing down? He says, well, we think they came back to us. We planned it that way. We expected these guys to run quick and then drop back is exactly according to plan for Michael Andretti. So Andretti and Vassar now in pursuit. Whoa, very close move to the inside of uh, Al Unser Jr. As Paul Tracy tries to close and come in, he wasn't able to get around Al Unser Jr. Take a look at the upper left-hand corner of your screen. Those on the move right now with Andretti the most obvious. And Paul, it's about that point of the race. They're 55 laps in now. And just as Newman Haas thought, it's not the fact they're going faster. Everybody else is starting to drop back. Christian Fittipaldi works on Greg Moore. Can't get it done there. The Swift chassis are working extremely well. It's the first time since 1992 that Cosworth have been shut out of qualifying. But come race time at Milwaukee, it doesn't make any difference. Things happen so fast here that if you blink for a moment, you go backwards so fast, you don't know what happened. You're watching the battle for fourth, Mar for a sixth, Moore and Fittipaldi. Jan Bikas. More information on Michael Andretti. Now that he has the lead, they radioed to him and said, watch the tires, make them last. This is going how we want it, but you've got to look after your tires just as we expected. Michael Andretti at the front, then Dario Franchitti, Vassar Montoya, Tracy Fittipaldi, and more. Nine times in 15 races at Milwaukee, Michael Andretti has had the lead. Just a bit on him now, maybe looking for a run. P.J. Jones closes tightly on Moore. Not a battle for position, but P.J. would surely like to try to get laps back. And even though these two corners look similar, Paul, it's difficult for the drivers to get the car set up. We've got a wind blowing from the turn one, two area, which make the cars naturally a little nervous, a little loose going through that section. The cars pick up a lot of understeer going through three and four with a trailing wind. The wings on these cars don't care about how fast the cars are going over the ground. They only care about airspeed. If you've got a 15-knot wind increase in one direction, it can adversely affect the handling of the car. And also, from a driver's perspective, these two corners drive very differently. And it's a team like Newman Haas that has years and years of experience that can go back and adapt that experience to the swift chassis and these Firestone tires, of which they've had very little test time here at Milwaukee, to get the most out of that combination. And in the hands of Michael Andretti, it's a golden combination. Here's Dan Gurney's uh, All-American effort that we've been watching the last couple laps. Alex Barron with that beautiful eagle painted on the nose of his car. 
He's closing on P.J. Jones. That is not a battle for position. His target is actually Roberto Moreno, 10th place, just ahead of P.J. Best qualifying effort for Alex. This Eagle chassis is very good at exactly this speed range, which is the 150 to 200 mile an hour range. It produces a lot of downforce. They're making the most out of the Goodyear tires and the Toyota motor, and they've done a great job. And I expect if this goes green to that first fuel stop that they will able to pick up some more spots prior to that stop. Looking back up the track now for Michael Andretti, leader of the race. There he is. A full three seconds now ahead of second place, Dario Franchitti. We had talked to starting that they could maybe go uh, to the 85th, 95th lap. We've had some yellow in there, so they could go to the 100th, I would think, at least, if the tires collapse. And it seems like they're all trying to nurse them that far. Well, you could see. Yellow comes out. This, of course, will change that as well. This is a yellow for something on the course, not contact with anything, not a spin. Pace car, pace car comes out in front of Michael. Well, they're well within the fuel window, Paul. They obviously are going to try to get on a new set of tires, a full load of fuel. This is the first opportunity for the drivers to really get any changes they want done to the car, either a stagger change, air pressure change, or a wing change. And we'll see by what changes are made during these pit stops, who's happy and who's not. I imagine Michael might do some very small fine-tuning. The rest of the paddock may be making some major changes. Field slows behind the pace car, 63 complete, 225 new distance here at Milwaukee with Michael Andretti as the leader, followed by Frankini, Vassar, Montoya, Tracy, and Fittipaldi. We'll be right back. As we are under caution for debris on the course, almost all of the crews have laid out anticipating the leaders coming in. The leader, of course, is Michael Andretti, and he turns down on pit road toward Jan Vikas. And of course, now they're going slower than they ever have before. 50 miles an hour is the speed limit. 51, you're going to get a black flag penalty. You'll also see many of the crews are going to be wearing helmets today, including Michael Andretti's crew. The bell helmets were given to all the teams. Over 100 have been given away. Michael comes to a stop, and they're going to go for four tires. They're not planning on making any changes. tried to leave and he caught one of his crew members because the fuel was taking a long time. The cart medical staff was on it immediately. Michael Andretti, Jim, they're leaving the car there. Of course, they can't do anything with it at the moment. Jim Harburg is his name and they're tending to him. And Paul, watching that, you can see the fueler and the vent man were still attached. It looked like Michael grabbed first gear. Sometimes the clutches get very hot and the cars start to creep, which is what we saw. If you use the brakes, the engine ends up stalling. I don't think there's really a lot that could have happened. It looked like the clutch just grabbed without anything Michael could do. And unfortunately, it took down one of the crewmen. But with this new helmet law that will be in full effect by Cleveland, a lot of the teams already wearing those helmets, it could be a real saving grace today. They uh, just now have been able to get Michael restarted and let him rejoin the rest of the field, which circulates under the yellow. Fortunately, the uh, Kart Safety MR10 team was right there. Todd Coulter, Royce Bellman both jumped right on that situation and began to administer aid. We'll be back with more in the Miller Lite 225 right after this. A week where a crew member has been involved in an incident with a car during a pit stop. Fortunately, they are beginning to mandate helmets for the crews, and fortunately, in this case, the person involved had a helmet on when Michael Andretti, not his own fault, was trying to get out of the pits. The clutch would not engage properly, was pulling the car forward, and the incident occurred. Now, Jan Bikas has more of an update for us. Yes, I do. The team was telling me who was involved, and in fact, they were mistaken. It is the vent man, Ty Manso, who is the one who is injured. So obviously there was quite a bit of confusion here. The team had misidentified him. Uh, he was certainly moving on his own, but they have immobilized him, which would be the standard course of action in something like this. And this accident is identical to what happened with the Walker team. Dave Stevens was run over almost in an identical fashion. And the reason is they are trying to leave as soon as they possibly can. But the guy who works the vent and the air jack has to lean over the car. And if you take off too soon, it's hard for that guy to get out of the way. 
And Michael Andretti still circling the course as the leader under yellow. You may remember too a week ago Dave Stevens uh, for Walker Racing was involved in an incident and the good news is that he is okay. Now we have another situation that has developed during this long caution and this incident and that involved Dario Franchitti who as he left the pits got entangled with some of the equipment of Paul Tracy just ahead of him. You see him there snag the air hose on the wrench and as a result the officials have sent him all the way to the back of the line. So at the front of the field two separate incidents affecting Michael Andretti and Dario Franchitti. Gary Gerald. And regarding the Franchitti incident, as he got over the hose of his teammate Tracy, the team is encouraging him on the radio in every lap. Don't worry about it. Be patient. You have the fastest car out there. Now, however, he's got to work from the back of this long line to try to get back into contention. And we'll be back with the restart on the Milwaukee Mile right after this. Back on the Milwaukee mile we've just taken the green Paul Tracy is the leader but that's Juan Montoya in second place Jimmy Vassar in third after the shakeup during the yellow flag and Tracy tries to pull away from Montoya and is successful he's done a very nice job there Paul he's got a lot of pressure after the incident last weekend riding with him but he is very very good on this track back behind first through third you can see from time to time Gil DeFerrin is being attacked by Roberto Moreno. Now, this is an answer to a black flag penalty as a result of that situation in Michael's pits. And the combination of the two have taken him well, well out of the competition and dropped him down to 21st position. At the front, Tracy Moreno still working on DeFerrin for fourth. Christian Fittipaldi just behind them, then Greg Moore and Adrian Fernandez. Michael rolls back onto the course. And Paul, on virtually every lap under yellow, Michael was on the radio to his crew wanting information about the injured crew member. He, you could just tell the tone in his voice that he was really distraught in the cockpit. Well, of course, Michael has been with that team for so long. It's very much a family situation at Newman Haas. You can imagine how he must be. And Paul, it's become so competitive on the track that everybody is pushed to the limit, not only driving and engineering, but also getting those pit stops done. Now, as Jan said, some of the incidents are caused because they get in a little bit of a hurry. The driver tries to leave. Sometimes he gets waved out a little bit soon. But in Michael's case, that was simply an overheated clutch because of the shifting that goes on on this oval. And the car was creeping. If he would have tapped the brakes, it would have stalled the engine. He thought he had enough time to clear everyone. As they finished the fueling, it just didn't happen. And at the very last instant, the clutch engaged completely. Not Michael's fault, a mechanical problem, not a crew chief problem. And of course, we gave you and you saw our initial impressions of that incident. We'll wait now for the official word to come from the Clark Medical Center and get an update. But last we heard, there was some movement, some conversation going on. So that at least seems like an initial good report. Here is Dario Franchitti as he begins to come back through the field. Remember, he was sent around to the back as a result of running over his teammate Paul Tracy's hose, air hose, as they came out of the pits. And the reason for that and why they take it so seriously is if you would hook that air hose, which is braided internally, it would become a giant rubber band with about a 15-pound air wrench on the end of it. But when it snapped back, it could easily do a lot of damage. Jan Bikas? Well, we were talking before the pit stops, what was the tire wear? Well, in the case of Jimmy Vassar, they say their right rear tire was better than they expected. So some of the chassis adjustments that they have made do seem to have worked. Now, one other thing that Parker was talking about, when the car is on the ground and they're fueling it, that is something relatively new. They're starting to drop the cars off the jack so the fuel will go faster into the car. I personally think that if they had to fuel the car on the jacks, you would alleviate this problem because the guy physically could not drive away. And, of course, that has been discussed. When I first started driving champ cars, my first crew chief said, you will not engage first gear until we're finished. So exactly a problem like that, or we saw Scott Pruitt earlier at Motegi, won't occur of a hot clutch grabbing with the car engaged in gear. So if it does drop on the ground, it should be left in neutral, because if you grab first gear, it can launch, just as we saw. Paul, after that last round of pit stops, we had some big winners and losers. Obviously, the trauma with the Michael Andretti incident dropped him from first to 22nd. Dario went from second to 14th with that penalty. Paul Tracy came in fifth, went out first. Jill DeFerrin came in eighth, went out fourth. And Roberto Moreno came out fifth place after entering in ninth. 
As we watch Jill DeFerrin, some stats on him. Perhaps the most important of this day is not on the screen. And that's it, Jill DeFerrin started in 16th, moved up, and then with a great pit stop, is now riding in fourth. Roberto Moreno is just behind him, but not able to attack. And now Dario Franchitti continues to work his way up through the field as he battles with Scott Pruitt. And this is a fight for 13th place, so it is a battle for position. And the report now from the backside, and there we can see it, Robbie Gordon has begun to slow. And we have no indication why at all. He will make it on the pit road and will easily make it to his pits. But Robbie Gordon, with his great saga of last weekend, missing victory in the Indy 500 by two and a half miles after crashing Saturday at St. Louis, now experiencing problems here in Milwaukee. He's had a rough eight days, no doubt, Paul. But yet, he is still full of enthusiasm and confidence. This entire crew is energized with the potential that they know will come. Well, we've been talking about the significance of the tires. What a great difference they make. Gary Gerald, what about the Firestone side? Just talked with one of the Firestone representatives. They've been monitoring the right rear wear after this first round of pit stops. They tell me that the wear is roughly 75 to 90 percent complete. So they're getting close to using the entire 100 percent, but no problems that weren't expected from them at this point. They're encouraged. At the front, it's Paul Tracy Montoya just behind him by a little over one second. And this is Frank Keedy still trying to work his way around through it. Just ahead of them, Alex Barron and Guzman have begun to close. There you see Barron. Pruitt's closing on Barron, and that's Guzman just ahead. And as we watch Pruitt and Frank Keedy, Paul, 299 Renards, but if we get a head-on shot of the front of the cars, you can see a significant difference in the front wings. As you look at Scott Pruitt's car, you'll notice that they droop towards the outside, which has been the standard procedure for Renard wings since their introduction in 1994. You can see it there. They droop about 15 degrees, but if you look at the trailing car, the wings of Dario Franchitti, they're horizontal. They've designed a new nose with these wings lower in the nose, which they say helps their overall aerodynamic package. And if you look at one of the older Renards, like the Frankenstein car that Adrian Fernandez is running, the front wings droop even more. So even though they're all Renards, not all Renards are created equal. Mauricio Guzman starts to work on Cristiano D'Amata. Just ahead of that battle involving Alex Barron. Well, Alex Barron's now working on Guzman pretty hard. And Scott Pruitt and Dario Franchitti are beginning to close as well. So now we have a five-way battle, and this is for 10. It's very difficult here if you're Mauricio Guzman or Alex Barron. You have a lot of turbulence, even though this is a relatively low-speed course. They're going through the corners at about 145 miles an hour and trying to find a place to stick the front of the car to get clean air over the front wings and through the under tray is very, very difficult. About 70% of the overall downforce is created from the underneath the bottom side of the car that we can't see. But you'll watch Mauricio trying to go to the inside of Cristiano looking for that clean air. You can see it there. And as long as Cristiano leaves the inside, he's going to leave himself under attack from Mauricio Guzman. He's got to go down the inside and take that air away. Otherwise, Mauricio will figure out how to time his attack on Cristiano to take over that position. Well, Robbie Gordon's crew still hovers over his car, but it doesn't look like Robbie Gordon is going to go much further, Jan. No, and he's looking carefully to see what they're going to be able to find on the car. Robbie, what happened? It started smoking really bad down in turn number one. I don't know if it's electrical, what the problem is, or he sprung a leak. Um, went in turn one, made a weird noise. All of a sudden, all kinds of smoke just started coming out inside the cockpit. Yeah, they're looking inside the car. They actually took the seat out. So did it come into you in your seating position? Uh, there was no heat, a lot of smoke. Uh, don't really know what the problem was, unfortunately. You know, we, we were pretty strong this morning. Lost our lap early in the race. We're trying to fight back, but that's the way it goes sometimes. Well, you've had a tough couple weeks. Thanks. Well, you saw Franchitti as he began to work his way through after getting around Pruitt, now works on Alex Barron. Coming up through the field. In the meantime, up at the front of the field, Paul Tracy, the leader of the race, but Montoya has begun to close in. He sits just about a half a second back, but from time to time, 
pokes right up under his rear wing. Gary Gerald? A lot of traffic concerns upcoming for Paul Tracy. Just check with Barry Green. He said we were absolutely thrilled with the tire wear on the right rear after Tracy's first stop. He's being challenged and challenged strongly by Montoya as they head for turn two. But Barry Green is happy. He said we're still concerned about tires. He said but it's tougher now to try to conserve tires when you're in the lead. Maybe, Parker, you could address that situation. Well, you've got a real problem, Gary, in that if you get too conservative and you hit traffic just right or just wrong, as the case may be, you could have two, three, or four cars all over the top of you. And so Paul Tracy has to find a balance of picking his way through traffic, trying to get breathing room between he and Montoya and Vassar, and then maybe conserving a little bit as he has clean air in front of him. But right now, he can't conserve at all, Paul. Whoa, Montoya struggles to control it as he comes down to the inside, tries to get alongside Tracy, can't do it, not happy with it, wants him to move over. Don't think that's going to happen, Juan. Right behind him, Jimmy Vassar, his teammate. So Tracy, Montoya, Vassar, first, second, and third, and that battle is tight. Well, he's got, Montoya's got some of the fastest hands in the paddock. I think in another life, he could have been one of the world's greatest pickpockets because we've seen him do things with his car that are just phenomenal. During qualifying, we saw great saves from another, uh, from a number of the drivers, whether it's Pappas, Carpentier, but on a regular basis, lap after lap, Montoya hangs it out farther than anybody else on the circuit today. One of those out prematurely, too, is Brian Hurdy on Vegas. Yes, now all of a sudden we have guys coming on pit road. Brian, what happened to your car? Well, we struggled all weekend, Jan, trying to find a balance and couldn't get it hooked up. The car was way loose in the race. Came in, made a spring change. We did, made it a little better, but at that point we were so far down and started going loose again. I, I want to apologize to my guys and Shell and, you know, Ford and Firestone and all, everybody on this team that's worked so hard because uh, yeah, I didn't get it done for them this weekend. I didn't figure out how to make the car go fast. And, you know, we got we got to do a better job. Uh, I'm, I'm going to take most of it on this one. I just say, uh, you know, I'll make it up to everybody and we'll be back strong in Portland next week. All right, you're on a road course. We'll see you there. Thanks. So the battle for the lead continues to tighten. Tracy is the leader, but he's being chased by Montoya and Jimmy Vassar. We'll be back with the Miller Lite 225 after this. Looking hot. That was amazing, Paul, in a very short amount of time. I'm not sure exactly if the car came right or Jimmy just said, now is the time to get it done. Vassar vaulted past Montoya. A great move going wheel to wheel, throwing wheels at him. He went with that same momentum past Tracy. Now he serves up Ellinger Jr. putting another lap on him. Jimmy is on fire. And look at this line that Montoya has been using the past few laps in turn two coming much higher than Paul Tracy or Jimmy Vassar for that matter. But Vassar overhauls the lead. Jan Bikas? Well, in the first stint, Paul, he was very loose in traffic, so they changed the tire pressures on that first stop, and they say that has made a world of difference for Jimmy. Well, we mentioned that Jimmy Vassar made a very quick move on Montoya. We want to take you back and show you that while we keep track of the lead. Jimmy down the inside at turn one. Montoya trying to go side by side, but watch what happens coming around the exit. Look how close that is right there, Paul. Jimmy stays in it. Montoya tries to stay in it, but he's on the gray side. And this was the pass for the lead as Jimmy Vassar, in turn one, was able to work down inside Paul Tracy and take over the lead. So now it's Vassar, Tracy, and Montoya, the top three, followed by DeFerrin Moreno and Christian Fittipaldi. Jimmy has had so much misfortune this year. Things just haven't gone his way. And Jimmy Vassar is one tough race driver. He's got experience, he's smart, he's patient, he knows when he's got to get it done. This weekend, by splitting the pits, maybe the team was sending a signal to him. Jimmy has responded like a true champion. Well, and that's exactly what you said at the, at the start of the program, was that Jimmy Vassar now needs really to focus on his competition here, and he certainly responded strongly, coming up behind Tony Kanaan. His tenure with Alex Zanardi only made him a better, stronger driver. A lot of other drivers would have collapsed under that pressure. Now he's got to deal with Juan Montoya. And Jimmy, I've known Jim for a very long time. He is very, very strong inside. And it just shows that when it gets going, when it, when it gets really tough, he just rises to the top. The stats on Jimmy Vassar with eight years in the series and horses championship in 96. A driven young man, a pleasant young man from up San Francisco Bay Area. 
Jimmy also knows what he needs to get out of this car. He made the corrections that he needed to. He and his engineer working together to get the balance right in traffic, as Jan talked about. And this is another team like Newman Haas, his target Chip Ganassi team, knows how to get the car working well to get to the checkered flag. Dario Franchitti, early leader, now working his way through the field, got around uh, around Alex Barron, then around Mauricio Guzman. Now those are cars that are off the lead lap, so they don't count, but here comes Franchitti working his way back, now running in 11. He's looking at the back of P.J. Jones, but as you said, P.J.'s already a lap down, so Franchitti's next target on his climb back up Right now is Patrick Carpentier. At the halfway point in the run now, the cross flags being thrown at the starting line with Jimmy Vassar as the leader, followed by Tracy and Montoya. 112 laps, new race distance this year. Wanted to give the fans a little more action. They were going so fast and the race is running out quickly. But at the same time, of course, the uh, rules makers changed the aerodynamic uh, construction on the car so that it slowed their overall lap speed and qualified to the record, which is up at about 185 miles an hour. Wasn't, weren't even close to it qualifying in the 165 range. Well, consider last year, Paul, that Patrick Carpentier did his qualifying lap nearly flat out around the entire track. Flat through three and four, he had just a tiny lift going down into turn one and two. And this year, they're on the brakes and downshifting. So it shows you how dramatic that change has been to the aerodynamic configuration of these cars. We're watching this three-way battle, Damata, Guzman, and Barron. We look at the Kmart telemetry on Mauricio Guzman as he closes up behind Damata. Barron closes behind him. These three cars have been locked in a battle for quite some time. If we get a look at the front of Guzman's car, Paul, we saw it debuted back in Nazareth. The, the nose strakes, the little platypus, uh, platypus extensions on the front of that car, looking for more downforce towards the front of the car. A development that was initiated by Pac West. Some of the other cars we saw run it at St. Louis. Some other people tried it here. Once again, as I said before, not all Renards are equal. Everybody looking for that extra advantage. And now the leader comes in behind this battle. There's a big traffic. And Montoya has been able to make a move on Tracy. On board, the leader, Jimmy Vassar, you ride with him. Montoya is now two seconds behind him. And Paul Tracy is right behind Montoya. Look how smooth Jimmy Vassar is compared to some of the other onboards that we've seen, Paul. Watch how gentle his initiation of the steering wheel is into the corner. Any feedback that you see there is hands moving. Simply feedback through the front wheels, through the suspension, back through the steering column. But look how relaxed his hands are, how nice and open they are. Watch how smoothly he turns into this corner and then just holds that long arc all the way out to the exit. It's difficult here coming off of turn four. That white wall has no markings on it. It's very easy to lose your depth perception and to get a good reference point as you come off of turn number four. This is the first race that Jimmy Vassar has led since his win at Fontana in California last year. Working on Alex Barron. Barron currently occupies 13th place. And Dario makes his move now, comes up to 10th place. Well, Frank Keaty's still coming through. He's second. There's third. There's the top of the field. And you ride for the moment with Max Pappas as the Miller Line 225 rolls past the halfway point with Jimmy Vassar as the leader. You're a yellow for Chegiaki Hattori who brushed the wall with his right front. But Montoya's team further down the pits were able to roll the car faster and Montoya took the lead with Vassar in second place. Now back to the action. There are first and second, Montoya and Vassar. And for the last several laps, they have been stationary relative to one another. Jill DeFerrin with a great run is now up in third place. Paul Tracy is fourth, Christian Fittipaldi fifth, and Roberto Moreno, another good run, sits in sixth. Let's go to Jan Vikas. Paul, we were talking about the pit stops for both the target boys, and Jimmy Vassar radioed in under the yellow, saying, I think that we lost the spot because of pit position. The fact that Juan Montoya had the very last pit made the difference. But I noticed one other thing. I think that Jimmy Vassar was here a fraction of a second longer because he took every ounce of fuel, and I think he's going to need it. Juan might be a little short. 
We've also been watching Dario Franchitti and his move through the field. He's now up to eighth, but he seems to have found his own level because Greg Moore was at battling with him just a moment ago and was able to get past him, moving Moore into seventh place. That last round of pit stops, Paul, the big winners, winners of course, Juan Montoya goes from second to first, Jill DeBaron from fourth to third, Christian Fittipaldi from sixth to fourth. So losers, Jimmy Vassar lost the lead, fell back to second. Paul Tracy went from third to fifth. Roberto Moreno from fifth to sixth. Now Christian Fittipaldi on the restart lost that fourth place and fell back to fifth. They've been running in that order ever since. And Jan Pekas, you have an official update now on the Andretti crew member. And I do. Ty Manso's condition, it's a good report. He is awake, no head injury. He does have, however, a possible cervical spine injury. He has been transported to the Freighton Hospital for a CAT scan and an X-ray of his neck. And so it could have been a lot worse, and let's hope that those X-rays come out negative. Well, that's a much better report than the first visual images. Michael Andretti, with all of that, dropped down to 20th place. And you can see on the race course, he is running in concert with his teammate, Christian Fittipaldi. Here's Dario Franchitti, Greg Moore just ahead. Moore just moved around him about four laps ago and they have been static in their relative positions on the race course, but they are beginning to close on Roberto Moreno. And Paul, as Jan mentioned, the real cat and mouse game towards the end of this race is fuel consumption. How hard can you run on how little fuel? On that last round of pit stops, they were right on the edge of the fuel range of these cars. This will be very, very interesting to see how it plays out. Can they make it to the end, or will they have to do a splash and go? Right now, these guys are driving absolutely as hard as they can using the least amount of fuel possible. The only hope is to go for the other strategy, crank it up to full power, and hope for a yellow where you don't lose track position, assuming everyone else is going to do the same thing. In the early going especially, it's been very busy at the front of the field as we look at the laps led. Jimmy Vassar right now with the most, but uh, well, there's still some room to earn that extra point for leading the most laps here. And Franchini, who of course was an early leader, ran over the hose of his teammate Paul Tracy and was moved around to the back of the field, still trying to work his way forward, but kind of locked right there in eighth place. These cars are so equally matched, the drivers all so good. The only thing that they're looking for now, Paul, is a mistake from the person in front of them, which is very unlikely, or coming up on lap traffic to try to use them to their advantage to get a run an advantage on the inside, the outside, as we've seen so many times in the last 160 laps. With 160 laps of the 225 complete, we look at the race recap, the 159th lap with the leader Montoya and the race average at 149 miles an hour. Very busy, as we suggested at the front. And this is a very busy racetrack. It becomes difficult even to talk to your crew. The straightaways are so short. Trying to get the sway bars adjusted, the weight jackers move, which transfers weight from one side to the other, depending on how the car is handling. It's a very, very busy place indeed. Shaggy Akiatori driving for Tony Bettenhausen, despite his brush with the wall, has been reported okay. You ride with Richie Hearn. We look at the Kmart telemetry. traded their Renards with for their Swifts. Their Swifts going to the Robbie Gordon team. Richie Hearns engineer Steve Connor having his hands full trying to get this car developed in a very short period of time without any testing. And Paul, they're running the new Toyota Phase 6 engine this weekend, the first Toyota team to do so. Whoa, Whoa big, Richie big Hearns moment Hearns. for Richie Hearn coming off the corner there. Almost takes her out to the wall, gets it back under control. Richie Hearn runs 18. And it's so hard for a driver when a car starts to go loose, Paul, to hold on to it. It's very easy to get discouraged. We saw earlier Brian Herta retiring his car because the car was so loose. I've made the mistake here in the past of having a very quick car, but a car that's gone loose. And instead of doing the wise, mature thing and pulling in and dropping out, I continued until I got in trouble. Brian Herta, a difficult circumstance. He came in. Richie Hurd trying to tough it out, trying to hold on to that new 99 Renard. Looking down from the Honda Helicam, Fernandez Carpentier battle. This is a fight for 10th place. 
Fernandez still using that Frankenstein conglomeration of 97, 98, 99 Renard parts. Their new car will be at the next race in Portland. Adrian can't wait for it to show up. The view from overhead, the Milwaukee Mile, a true oval. We call them one, two, three, and four in terms of turns, but uh, there's really the south end, turn one and two, and the north end, turn three and four. Back taking a look at DeFerrin now. Paul Tracy working on him. This is a battle for third. And that tire story continues to play. Goodyear v. Firestone. One theoretically able to go a little bit further. That would be the Goodyears on the DeFerrin car, but certainly the Firestones holding their own. The question two, this point to run becomes, with 59 laps to go, that of fuel. Gary Gerald. Paul, we didn't think the fuel would be a factor because these teams get such great mileage now with the small wings on the short ovals, many of them getting well in excess of two and a half miles per gallon. But the fuel scenario for the target cars driven by Montoya and Bastard is going to be very much a factor. The general consensus now in the Montoya camp is he will have to make a stop in these remaining, what, 58 laps or so. Jimmy Vassar, meanwhile, is being told, try to conserve just a little bit. If he can do that, there is the opportunity for him to go all the way. So, two different camps. Their pits are split, as you mentioned, for the first time in years, and two totally different strategies for the remaining laps. You know, that's an interesting report, though, in light of the fact that we had noted the care that Jimmy Vassar's crew took getting the fuel in it, and both cars stopped on the same lap so we'll see how that plays out within the uh, target chip ganassi team between montoya and jimmy vassar so now with 169 laps of the 225 complete the battle is again at the front tonight seven o'clock espn two you like the diggers the drag racing well kenny bernstein is defending top fuel champion in the Fram Route 66 Nationals. Coverage tonight on the Deuce. For more, log on to ESPN.com, part of the Go Network, go.com. Back at the Milwaukee Mile. Teammates, Juan Montoya, the rookie, Jimmy Vassar, the veteran, defending champion here of the race, and the former Kart Series champion in second place. Dill DeFerrin with a terrific run for Derek Walker's team, sits in third, Paul Tracy, sits right now in fourth place, followed by Christian Fittipaldi. And Paul, the word has gone out to Paul Tracy to conserve fuel. So he's also in that mode where he may not be able to get full effectiveness from the power plant trying to avoid a late race pit stop. Well, Paul, they all have Honda power plants up front with Montoya, Vassar, DeFerrin, and Tracy. You've got four Hondas, a little different strategies between teammates Montoya and Vassar. I can tell you right now, Montoya, Tracy, and I'm sure a few other drivers are praying for a yellow flag so they can lean it back and get to the end. The other drivers want it green. Vassar wants it green, as well as some of the others, depending on their strategies. We focus on the battle for third. The blue and white car is DeFerrin, followed by Paul Tracy circulating this track lap after lap after lap just watching one another working wondering where this entire end game is going to go we look at the laps led by engine and as Parker just suggested with the Honda up in the front so much they are leaving leading a great deal now then there's the whole situation that we talked about of fuel they're getting greater fuel economy than they ever have Jan Bikas it's doing even better. Yeah, you're right, and that's because the small wings do not make as much drag, so you use less fuel. It used to be when you would race here, you get 1.85 miles to the gallon. That's how much fuel cart gives you. Well, it's my understanding there's some cars out there near the lead at the moment that are getting three miles per gallon. Whoa. And that's about, Paul, what you're going to need if you want to make it. I believe it was lap 133 that they pitted or went back to green. You'd have to make almost three miles per gallon if you want to make it to the end without a stop. Boy, that is remarkable in terms of fuel flow when you're used to looking at numbers like 1.7, 1.8. And they're also getting good mileage not only because of the reduced downforce, but because they have to lift off the throttle for so much longer than they ever did before that off-throttle time is also making a significant contribution to the overall fuel mileage. Watching DeFerrin, there's Tracy. We do want to take you up toward the front of the field on board Jimmy Vassar. Now, here's a good, good opportunity to kind of listen to that throttle. You can see, Paul, he doesn't pick the throttle up until he's well past the halfway point of the corner. 
in years past, you just slipped on the entry and start picking up the throttle right about here. Now listen how much longer it takes. See, right there, it's about four or five car lengths coming off of turn four than it was in previous years. Let's go to his teammate, Juan Montoya. We'll listen there as well. Reminder, the leaders last pitted on the 124th lap. Whoa! Juan does that as if it's just part of the routine, and apparently for him it is. Well, eventually, Paul, it's going to catch him. Watching Jimmy Vassar's on board, you can see how steady and how consistent Jimmy was. Juan is much more on the edge of the tightrope. I hope this doesn't bite him because he's got to drive the car extremely hard if he's trying to conserve fuel in order to get the most out of his lap times. And Parker, have you noticed if he's shifting? Because that would be one of the tricks to save fuel if you were no longer downshifting. Yes, yeah. both drivers are shifting at this point, but even the style of shifting can make a big difference in fuel consumption, depending on how much revs and how long you drag the throttle heel and towing going down into the corner. Now, one is a right foot breaker. He's rocking his foot back and forth between the brake and the throttle, even on an oval, whereas Jimmy, traditionally on an oval as well as road courses is left foot braking allow him allowing him i think paul to be able to modulate the throttle a little more easily to conserve fuel while he's catching montoya something that came for jimmy vassar out of his early experience which was on ovals and things like quarter midgets now they begin to close once again in the battle for the lead you look at the times closing the last couple of laps with Alex Barron sitting ahead of the leaders, running not that much, but slightly slower than the lead. Parker, I've got a question down here relating to this traffic. I'm wondering if is there any advantage in fuel conservation for the fact that Vassar runs behind his teammate in the less air. Can you conserve fuel on a short track that way? Sure you can. And, and what we're talking about here, Gary, is just very small amounts. A lap can make all the difference in the world. So just about the distance Jimmy is right now, four to five car lengths back, is probably the perfect area you need to catch the back of the draft of this group of cars in front of him while still having clean enough air to not affect the balance and the handling of the car through the corners. Like the sportsman he is, Dennis Vitolo moves offline, lets Alex Barron, and then the leaders come through. Barron is chasing Scott Pruitt, who sits just ahead of him, and that is a battle for position. 13th, in fact. Paul, but you have to wonder, from Jimmy Vassar's standpoint, do you count on the fact that one will have to pit and do a splash and a go? Do you take a chance on a yellow flag, or do you push, push, push to try to force him into a mistake, which we haven't seen during the course of a race yet this year? What do you do? I mean, what's the strategy? Do you rely on information between your team and your teammates' team? I think you have to go for it. You have to take every advantage if you can, as you can, because if you rely on the circumstances, you may not finish any better than second place. Well, and we haven't seen these two teammates in the direct confrontation that they're in now with a battle for the lead as the laps begin to wind down toward the end of the race, but it does put you in mind of Team Green's situation where three times, and uh, one of those, a battle for the lead, the two teammates got in confrontation and end up ruining the race for both. Well, we know how aggressive Juan is. We know that Jimmy's also aggressive. Jimmy, very, very smart. He's not going to risk the car unless he absolutely has to. And with 35 laps to go, that might sound like a long time. But I'm telling you, that's going to go by very, very quickly. He's got to try to use Barron to his advantage and the other lap traffic to try to get a hold of this lead. Well, Barron is only a slight factor for Jimmy Vassar. Vassar is right back in contact. And I got to tell you, given Montoya and Vassar, I really have to go with the veteran's experience that Jimmy Vassar has. And second place may be the better place to be. But of course, the fuel strategy is the key on Vegas. It is, and I just spoke with Tom Anderson. Actually, we didn't speak. He gave me the crossed finger signal. In other words, I have my fingers crossed, meaning we are going to try and make it to the end, but it will be extremely tight for Jimmy Vassar. Well, just 33 miles to go to the end. 124 the last time they spot. Boy, that, that just seems like... Obviously, what Tom Anderson is suggesting, it's going to be right on the edge. And as we noted during that last pit stop, we know Jimmy got every ounce of fuel into his tank. Jimmy's very, very good at conserving fuel. It's a matter of trying to figure out what your teammate's doing, trying to second guess their strategies. Juan's car is already loose, Paul. If it goes looser, Jimmy, with as consistent as his car is, should be able to make a move on Montoya. And I'm gonna go with you. I think that Jimmy's going to have the upper hand by the time this is done. 
Well, Jimmy Vassar works on his teammate Juan Montoya in the closing laps here. 194 complete at Wisconsin State Fair Park of the Miller Lite 225. We'll be right back. Nothing has changed since we left you to still Montoya, followed by Vassar, DeFerrin, Tracy, Fittipaldi, and Moreno. But as we run to these closing laps of the race, the fuel very definitely a critical concern for the top two cars in the field. And we are also going to check with everyone else in the top of that order because the theory that I'm operating on with everybody stopping on lap 124 pretty well puts the next refueling at the 224th to the 225th mile. And Paul, if you're really thinking out there, you're gonna have the car on as lean a setting as you can during those yellow laps before we went green. You're gonna try to take every advantage of traffic you can to get a draft as Gary had brought up. But now that they're right in the thick of traffic, traffic could be more of a determining factor than fuel itself. For Paul Tracy, he's using sixth gear as much as possible, trying to drop those revs just a bit and conserve fuel that way. So hard to try and conserve fuel and yet remain in the heat of a battle. And that's what makes this racing so interesting, Paul. It's not WWF on a Thursday night Nitro special. <laughs> it's a chess game. It's these guys driving absolutely as hard as they can, getting the most out of the chassis while trying to be as gentle and as careful with the engine management as they possibly can. Yeah, in their own way, the champ cars are very subtle. You watch for just quick little moves of the hand or dart of the nose to tell you how a car is operating. Back with Christian Fittipaldi has a nice run going. Sits in fifth place, Jan. Yeah, the unfortunate news is they have told us Christian Fittipaldi will have to pit for fuel. Now, of course, if everybody does, that's not bad news. But if Vassar can make it, that'll kill you. Montoya, Vassar, DeFerrin, Tracy, Fittipaldi, top five. Moreno, Moore, Franchitti now up to eighth place. And Damata battles with Fernandez at this moment. Carpentier in 11th, Guzman in 12th. Well, we can see even from the rearward facing camera here on Montoya how nervous his car is on the entry to mid corner. You can see the back of the car moving around a lot. Vassar's car much more secure, much more steady. And as the laps wind down, Montoya's situation will only get worse. We'll see how quick his hands are, Paul. They are fast. He's got great reflexes, tremendous car control. It's going to be a handful, especially in traffic, as he runs in disturbed air. Jimmy's car, I think, is in much better shape to deal up this traffic. So with Jimmy Vassar, he sits, he watches, he waits, and from his cockpit, he can study what Montoya just ahead is doing, lap after lap, and the attitude of that car. Montoya does not have that advantage. He doesn't. He has got to be absolutely on the charge. He's got to look forward and not to the rear. But look how quick Jimmy is through the mid-corner here. And I can tell you, though, Jimmy may be watching, but he's not waiting. He's doing everything he can to take advantage of the situation. He's got to run very, very close to Montoya so that if there is a break in traffic, if someone guesses wrong, he's got to be there to take advantage of it. And there seems to be no further indication of when to expect a stop, but it seems to be clear in the Montoya pit, he will have to stop. They still think Vassar's okay on fuel. Now the gamble becomes more pronounced for Montoya. He obviously won't want to leave that racetrack in the lead. He may be forced to shortly. Well, Gary, that brings the question up. We noted that the two Ganassi pits are now separated, separated by a fairly considerable distance. Does the team share that kind of information? I think they're obviously very aware of what's going on with each other. How much direct conversation there is, I don't know. Well, it will be interesting to see then how this runs to the finish and how, uh, how much information is passed and how, once again, that split has affected the internal workings of the target ship Ganassi team. Because the other strategy here is, Paul, as I said earlier, if you're Montoya, do you just go to full power knowing that you have to pit? But then if a yellow comes out, you can still stretch it? Or do you try to conserve, hoping that you don't have to pit, hoping for something else to happen? It can go either way. You go full power and take your chances, or you better off, I think, being in Jimmy Vassar's position, knowing that you can make it, pressuring your young teammate into a mistake, or at least to use more fuel than is necessary to get to the end of the race. So the battle in the Miller line, 225, continues to be up at the front with Montoya and Vassar. Jimmy sitting back there, looking to make his move on his teammate rookie.
changed on the track, but we have had a constant battle for the lead throughout this day. It started out with Elio Castro Nevis on the pole and taking the early lead, and then uh, P.J. Jones got in trouble. Everybody went for every position to try to get around him, and everyone got around clean. But that's created an interesting battle at the front of the field. And it has shifted the leaders constantly throughout the day, made it a fuel battle. And now as we go back and join the action live, here is Montoya. Montoya comes onto the pit road and goes for fuel, Gary. It's a splash, it's a time stop, no new tires, he's gone, had him just under five seconds in here. Well, the suggestion was that that would happen, and the first indication we got was that Tony Kanan's crew laid out and began a refueling process. Now Jill DeFerrin comes in. Jimmy Vassar, of course, assumes the lead, but how good is the fuel in Jimmy Vassar's car? Well, Paul, we've got 15 laps to go here. I thought at least they'd get a little closer to the end before they had to come in. Yellow flag comes out at the starter stand. Situation over in turn one, and that is Roberto Moreno sideways on the course. Looks like he just spun to that point. The tracks don't go up all the way to the wall, and there's no obvious damage on the car. Paul, he we saw have... contact in turn one. I believe they bumped wheels with either one of the Newman Haas cars. I yeah. thought it was Christian Fittipaldi. Exactly. That's who it was. Christian Fittipaldi got against him. Thank you, Gary. So you've got to be hating life if you're Jill DeFerrin or Juan Montoya oh, exactly. at this point, Paul. That's the worst possible scenario you could have. You drive that far, you lead, and then all of a sudden, as you come into the pits, this happens. Jan Vikas, what about Jimmy Vassar now? Oh, there was a huge cheer down here when they saw the yellow flags. And you know what? They are acting like they might bring Jimmy in and give him some fuel. So they may have been this whole time telling us they could make it when, in fact, they weren't sure if they could. But pitting under yellow versus pitting under green obviously will be a major advantage for Jimmy. If they thought they were close and they hit this yellow, he should be able to make it to the end now. Yeah, but it, it does mean that he is going to give up some track position if he does that. Well, exactly, Paul. Then you have to wonder if whether we've been used in this whole strategical battle. Oh, that'd be a shock. I'm starting, yeah, that'd be a shock, <laughs> huh? Because I'm starting to think if he ca if Montoya came in that far from the end of the race, how close could Jimmy be? We saw DeFerrin come in, and now it's a track position battle because Montoya's got enough to get to the end. If he stayed on the lead lap, and we'll find that out in just a minute, if he was able to stay on the lead lap and Jimmy came in, he'll line up behind him, which will make it very, very interesting. And Joe LeBaron got out in front of Juan as well. You know, the, the, we, we suggested, you're talking 124, here comes Vassar coming into the pits. 124, the last stop, they're trying to go to 225. Oh, boy, that was a long way. And so I, I think you just have to do the simple math, right, Jan? Well, here is the answer to our math quiz, and that is that Jimmy Vassar is going to go ahead and take the field. Well, he's going to take off 3.3, and he's out of here. I think they lied to us, Paul. Yeah, Paul Tracy, though, stayed out, so we'll see what Paul Tracy's situation is. He's leading behind the pace car. This is going to be a nice sprint to the finish, 213 complete. And when they come back, they'll see that green flag, and we'll find out how truthful Tracy is and what Montoya, Vassar, and Moore can do. Tracy, the leader of the race, we're anticipating a green flag here with a sprint to the finish. 219 laps complete, 225 the distance. Paul Tracy has seven cars that separates his lead position from the second place car of Greg Moore. Tracy answers the green flag. The question now, can he make it to the end? How much fuel is on board that car? Paul, I think we can give you an answer. Those last two laps of yellow may have been an absolute lifesaver for Paul Tracy. Barry Green had said it is going to be so close we'll be on fumes. I asked him as they came down to go green, how much has it helped you? He said, big time, we may be okay. Well, Parker Johnstone, right behind him, these seven different cars, don't you let some of them go? Or do you want to run on your pace? Paul, you want as many cars in between you and second place as absolutely possible. But the problem is, Paul has got to get fantastic fuel mileage in order to get to the checkered or hope for another yellow before the end. Four laps to go. Now Tracy crosses the line. Jan Vikas. Well, let's talk about Greg Moore. He's another guy who did not stop, and Steve Chalice's engineer just gave me the nod. Yes, we can make it to the end on fuel. 
So Paul Tracy is the question mark. Can he carry that car the remaining two and a half laps, two and a half miles that he now has to run in order to get to the finish and win the Miller Lite 225? Moore is second, DeFerrin third, Carpentier fourth, Montoya and Vassar fifth and sixth. As we suggested, they gave away track position having to fuel, but obviously they had no choice. Paul Tracy works the back stretch into three. White flag will come out next time around for Paul Tracy. The only thing that can stop him is his own fuel tank. This will be a remarkable run if, in fact, he is able to make it all the way as the white comes out. And if, in fact, he would run out, how far can he coast? And can he coast and still keep everybody back? We've seen some races end exactly that way. Rick Mears, Johnny Rutherford ran to the finish that way. But now, fourth turn. Paul Tracy comes to the line. And look at this. An amazing victory as Paul Tracy takes his 14th career win. Paul Tracy. Oh, unbelievable how far he was. Guys, great job. Paul Tracy congratulates and thanks the crew. He carries that car with the help of that crew. An amazing distance in scoring his second win here at Milwaukee and the first since St. Louis in 1997. So he comes from uh, being in pretty serious trouble last week at St. Louis to the victory here today. And the green team is happy about that one. Tony. Oh. Paul Tracy, we're trying to listen to his radio, and it's being pretty quiet considering we'll give you the unofficial result while he rolls to a stop. Tracy Moore to Farron. Carpentier, Vassar, Montoya. Boy, for Montoya and Vassar, who were such a factor at the lead a little earlier, what an interesting change of circumstance toward the end. And pit strategy, teamwork, fuel conservation all played a huge role in the outcome of this race, Paul. And it's so good for Paul Tracy. He's had such misfortune the last few years, and today it finally all came together. So Paul Tracy savoring the moment, Gary Gerald. Indeed he is. He comes out. The helmet comes off. Congratulations are offered by Greg Moore. Here comes the presentation of a beautiful piece of hardware, actually glassware for Paul Tracy. The crew now engulfs their driver. And Milwaukee pandemonium as Paul Tracy has repeated a victory. A hug and an embrace from Barry Green. And Paul, the fuel game in the last few laps was oh so critical. How scared were you? Well, I was. My, uh, my fuel light was on. Uh, fuel pressure warning light was on for the last five laps. And I just can't believe it. We've worked so hard on this team with with Cool and Klein and and everybody and the whole crew and Tony and Tony Sicali and I just got to thank everybody for the chance that they've gave me. Paul, after what happened a week ago at St. Louis, when you got into contact with your teammate and then the meeting and I know tensions and concerns had to be high. What does this victory now mean to you? Oh, I'm just so happy. I mean, I'm uh, for the whole team. I mean, Dario's been had had a big string of luck going and and we've just had the uh, the short end of the stick for a long time and. You know, the crew stuck with me, and the whole team has stuck with me, and I just, I'm just glad I got the job done for them. A 14-time career winner, a second time at it's Milwaukee. Nice, nice Congratulations. To off, nice to get off a of 13. <laughs> yes, indeed. Jan Bikas? Well, much different emotions down here for Chip Ganassi and target team Ganassi. Tom Anderson, you just said you think you may have cost Jimmy the race. Oh, I definitely cost him the race, Jan. There's no question about it, especially with the yellows as long as they were. We had enough fuel to go, and... Jimmy had the car. I mean, Jimmy and Julian had everything working right. Uh, they had the Firestone tires living all day, and uh, the Honda was leaned down, as proved Tracy did with the Honda engine. So, you know, I cost our guys the race today. There's no question about it. Tough luck. Some personal courage out of Tom Anderson to take the heat for not one, but two drivers who would have been in the battle. Here's the way the points go with uh, seven races complete, and Juan Montoya still holding on to the lead in that points battle, but it remains very, very tight indeed. The race run 225 miles at the Milwaukee Mile. Our final Toyota Spotlight takes a look at another great race on the Milwaukee Mile with Paul Tracy coming home as the victor. This is Paul Page for Parker Johnstone, Jan Vikas, and Gary Gerald. In just two weeks, the Cart FedEx Championship Series will be at Portland International for the Budweiser 200 and coverage on ABC Sports. We'll see you then. ABC Sports is online at ESPN.com, part of the Go Network.